On January 29th at 2 a.m. in Chicago, Jesse Small at the Black Gay Actor, who is in the TV series Empire, was attacked by two masked men who beat him and poured a substance which is believed to be bleach on him. They called him that FN on Empire. They put a noose around his neck. They shouted, this is MAGA territory. Make America great again. Smollett had just flown in from a flight from New York that had been delayed and he was hungry so he had stopped at that subway on his way home to his apartment. Empire was created by Lee Daniels and when he found out about what had happened to Jesse, it took him some time but he posted the following on social media. It has taken me a minute to come to social media about this because, Jesse, you are my son. You didn't deserve, nor anybody deserves, to have a noose put around your neck, to have bleach thrown on you, to be called die faggot, go, go n, or whatever they said to you. You're better than that. We are better than that. America is better than that. It starts at home, yo. We have to love each other regardless of what sexual orientation we are because it shows we are united on a united front and no ra racist F can come in and do the things that they did to you. Hold your head up, Jesse. I'm with you. I'll be there in a minute. It's just another effing day in America. I couldn't get the image of the noose out of my head. I couldn't let the image of a black man at this time in our history having a noose put around his neck. It was our director of lifelong learning, Katie, who said to me when I was talking about the story in staff meeting, why are you surprised? Just another day in America for black people. For me, it was a time when I was awakened yet again from the fact that I function on white privilege cruise control. This kind of incident happens every day all across America, and it's been happening every day since the first black slave was pulled off a ship and forced to walk on this soil. Black people deal with the possibility of what happened to Jesse every day, 24-7. Why would they be surprised that a noose was slipped around a black TV star's neck? It is we who are white that are surprised and outraged. I am not sure black, black folks have the energy to be surprised anymore. Outraged, yes. But surprised, no. Post Ferguson, the killing of unarmed black men and children by police were all over the social media for us to watch. After Eric Gardner's death and his last words, I can't breathe, I stopped watching those videos. But my black colleague said to me, I watch every one. I have to. This is another piece of white privilege that those of us who are white need to be reminded of. We can turn off our wokeness, turn it off or on at will. We can simply walk away from, take a break from dealing with the realities of racism, white privilege and white supremacy. We can turn off NPR or the news or put down the paper or the magazine, put our hands over our ears. We can close our eyes. We can walk away saying, it's enough, I can't take any more. Black people don't have that option. There is no safe place for them to retreat to, no place to run, no place to hide. These times are not a repeat of Selma. Having marched with Dr. King does not give any of us who are white a pass when it comes to racism white privilege or white supremacy. 
nor does having black or brown or biracial grandchildren, nor does any scholarly paper we have written on the topic, nor do all of the workshops we have taken on anti-racism over the years. There is no pass. And when we intellectualize the realities of racism, white privilege, and white supremacy, we are actually colluding with all of them. We can't hide behind intellectualizing or merely analyzing the institutionalization or systemization of all three. We can't make this work of allyship more comfortable by only focusing on the systems that maintain racism, white privilege, and white supremacy. That allows us to keep it all at arm's length. We have to make these issues personal. For as black folks have been reminding us over and over again, racism is not a black problem, it is a white problem. This work of allyship, of dismantling the societal structures is not intellectual work. It is hard, uncomfortable, emotional work. Blogger Didi Delgado writes, I believe that's why so many white allies treat dismantling racism like they're demanding to speak to the manager at Whole Foods. <laughs> they want instant gratification, and they want to be credited for the inconvenience. What I'm asking is that you make yourselves uncomfortable at every opportunity, because unlike your discomfort, Mine is not optional. White privilege used to be described as, quote, the idea of white privilege as unseen, unconscious advantages. It was described as unearned, created and maintained by institutions in our society. On the Teaching Tolerance website, they challenged that understanding of white privilege by saying, those interpretations overshadow the origins of white privilege, as well as its present day ability to influence systemic decisions. They overshadow the fact that white privilege is both a legacy and a cause of racism. Or as another black blogger writes, the conventional wisdom on privilege often says that its benefits are unearned. However, this belief ignores the reality and history that privilege is earned and maintained through violence. Now, by this point, I am imagining that some of your hackles are up. We who are white, we don't like that word white supremacy. In fact, there are folks who have said, well, can't we just call it something else? The answer is no. White supremacy, as Asha Hauser says, is the water we swim in. She's a religious educator up in Bellevue. It is the belief that all that is white is supreme and all that is not is less than. And whiteness is the supreme norm that all else is defined against. This desire to change the language to make it more palatable brings us to the reality of what the sociologist Robin D'Angelo has termed white fragility. This is how she defines it. A state in which even a minimal amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a rage of defensive moves. These moves include outward display of emotions such as anger, fear and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-induced situation. It is an inability to tolerate any kind of challenge to our racial reality. We shut down or lash out, or in whatever way possible, block any reflection from taking place. 
For white people, their identities rest on the idea of racism as about good or bad people, about moral or immoral acts. And if we're good, moral people, we can't be racist. We don't engage in those acts. This is one of the most effective adaptations of racism over time. That we can think of racism only as something that individuals either are or are not doing. And yes, folks have taken off their hoods, as is evidenced by the marchers at the University of Virginia in 2017. It's been just about a year since that happened. Or the folks that show up to Black Lives Matter rallies wearing paramilitary gear, proudly and defiantly armed to the hilt with weapons. But as the black blogger Michael Harriet wrote in his online article entitled, It's Official, White Allies Are the Worst W-Y-P-I-P-O in the World. He says, there's no reason to fear neo-Nazis or racists screaming at Walmart checkout counters. You can see them coming. But white allies will stand close enough to smoothly slice open your guts so fast you won't even feel it until they're stomping on your spilled entrails. And they are as slick as they are evil. That's why white allies are the worst because they know the exact right pitch in which to sing their siren song, because they get close enough to shoot you point blank and make sure you're dead, because there is actually something more dangerous than your worst enemy, an enemy who you think is a friend. Discussions around race almost all, are almost always uncomfortable for those of us who are white, and we often spend time trying to prove our cred as an ally or explain all the ways in which we are not racist. We have big emotions around these topics and they get centered when we have these conversations in multicultural groups. We will often be overwhelmed by feelings of guilt and shame and unconsciously seek absolution from people of color in the room, which in turn shifts the focus of the work away from the realities of people of color and has them taking care of those of us who are white and further burdening them with our emotions. One of the other things that we do in our quest to be good allies is expect every person of color to educate us on issues of race and we think that their mere presence in a room gives us the green light to have discussions about race. In her article, While People of Color Need Spaces Without White People, Kelsey Blackwell writes, if you're a person of color, conversations about race are unavoidable. We're pulled into them, whether, we're invited such, whether we've invited such discourse or not. White people often interpret our mere presence in a room as an opportunity to talk about race. And these are not conversations we always want to have. If you're a person of color, the reality of racism is neither optional nor conceptual. It is deeply and painfully felt. Those of us who are white, well, especially we who are Unitarian Universalists, we like to intellectualize things. And we do this with issues of race and white supremacy. And the UU activist Chris, Chris Crass warns that we have to be careful that anti-racism for white people doesn't become a monastic life, hoping to educate oneself out of compliance with white supremacy. We aren't looking he says, for individual enlightenment. We're looking to be part of dynamic, messy, grassroots initiatives to disrupt and challenge white supremacist capitalist patriarchy 
by building the capacity of ourselves and other white people to both respond to the calls, and there are many, from black leaders on actions to take. And he goes on to say that we cannot workshop our way out of fear. And he addresses what I believe is a very common fear for those of us who seek to be anti-racist. We want to get it right. We are really afraid of offending. We are really scared that we're going to make mistakes. And that fear can keep us cocooned in our white spheres. But here's the truth that Crass names. When it comes to this work, he says, there is no such thing as having it all figured out. We figure it out as we go. No one, including people of color, have the answer of how to end racism, white privilege, and white supremacy in this country. It is a process of trial and error and requires audacity and courage. Courage to show up again and again to do the work, even when you get it wrong. As my friend Sean once said, we have to show up, shut up, and listen. And then, when we are called upon, take action, however imperfect it is. As Crass says, if you choose to do social justice work, you're going to screw up a lot. Be prepared for that. And when you screw up, be prepared to listen to those who you hurt. Apologize with honesty and integrity. Work hard to be accountable to them. And make sure you act differently going forward. In a perfect world, what has become known as colorblindness is the perfect reality. But we don't live in a perfect world. And so the idea that we don't see color and that any of us treats people of all races and ethnicities the same is an impossible claim. It's our desire. And I, remembering uttering those very words myself that I don't see color, but it's impossible, really, to say I don't see color. But what we need to remember is that our differences that make a difference. Differences that make a difference. To ignore those differences is to actually have the opposite effect than what we intend. Those differences often make up a large portion of a person's identity. It doesn't mean that their difference, whether it be the color of their skin, their disabled or able-bodied, their class, their education, their affectional orientation, their gender expression, or numerous other characteristics that we use to define who we all are. But to try to bury those differences in an effort to see all humanity as essentially the same is to render those folks invisible. Writing in Color Lines, Jamila King says, listen, if your ability to respect someone's right to exist requires pretending that they are just like you, that's a problem. We are not all the same. And things like race and gender, disability, et cetera, are exactly the kinds of things that shape our lives and our experiences and make us different from one another. Being different is not the problem. The idea that being the same as you is what gives us the right to exist is the problem. A rule of allyship embrace the reality that there are differences that make a difference. Another rule, intention does not equal impact. There is a reason that we have that expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It's what Michael Harriet meant when he said, white people are the worst allies. Here's the other thing about allyship. It's not about those of us who are seeking to be allies. 
It's about becoming aware of the realities of racism and white privilege and white supremacy. Activist Laura Lamoon put it best when she wrote, an ally should be personally gaining nothing through their activism. In fact, if you're an ally, you should be losing things through your activism. Space, voice, recognition, validation, identity, and ego. As the black blogger Mia McKenzie writes in her article, No More Allies, allyship is not supposed to look like this, folks. It's not supposed to be about you. It's not supposed to be about your feelings. It's not supposed to be a way of glorifying yourself at the expense of folks you claim to be an ally to. It's not supposed to be a performance. It's supposed to be a way of living your life that doesn't reinforce the same oppressive behaviors <coughs> you're claiming to be against. A cautionary request from me, if you choose to engage in this work. Please don't start your sentences with this phrase. As a person with privilege, now why? Because that's a throwaway phrase that seeks to clear you of anything that you may say afterwards. The phrase protects you from being called out on your supremacy and privilege. In other words, it's uttered prophylactically. And when it comes to race, there are no prophylactics. That's my pet peeve from too many of these discussions and too many of workshops with too many well-intentioned white folks. Again, intention does not equal impact. Are you disheartened? Fair enough. That's the price of waking up. But here are the suggestions from two persons of color about what is needed to be an ally. Again, blogger Mia McKenzie, shutting up and listening. Educating yourself. You could start with the thousands of books and websites that already exist and are chock full of dang near everything anyone needs to know about most systems and practices of oppression. When it's time to talk, not talking over the people you claim to be in solidarity with. Accepting feedback and criticism about how your allyship is causing more harm than good without white-splaining, mansplaining, whatever-splaining. Shutting up and listening some more. Supporting groups, projects, orgs, etc., run by and for marginalized people so our voices get to be the loudest on the issues that affect us. And seven, not expecting marginalized people to provide emotional labor for you. Reverend Angel Kyoto, a black Buddhist teacher who has written extensively on race and racism says, the only thing I wanna hear from white people about race is, I'm sorry. I didn't see, I didn't listen. I'm working to see and learn now. Working to end racism in the systems that support it will help anyone who is oppressed because we are helping to reveal the lines through which power runs. Race, gender, age, and all forms of identity and appearance privilege are like a tapestry. You pull one thread and the whole picture changes. No one form of oppression can be addressed as the linchpin to change all the others. One act does not make a person an ally. It is a practice that must be exercised and refined again and again and again. And it, when it comes to undoing white supremacy, allyship is a status that is conferred by people of color, not claimed by a white person. The UCC minister, Melanie Morrison, talks about a turning point in her work on all of these issues and on trying to become a good ally. When she heard these words from her black friend, her black friend said to her, what happens when I'm not here, Melanie? How are you as a white person holding other white people accountable? How are other white people doing that for you? Racism is a white problem. 
and it's long past time for you all to do your work. I appreciate that you want to understand my experience as a person of color in this country. But what I need most from you, Melanie, is that you begin to understand your own. I need for you to do the strenuous work of understanding what it means to be white in America. Unless you do that, you are dangerous. If I asked you to define what culture, white culture, what would you say? If I asked you what it means to be white in today's world, what would you say? I throw these questions out there because what I hear over and over again from people of color is not the request for white people to be allies, but for us to, quote, do the work. Do the work of answering what it means to be white, prying apart the ways all of us who are white benefit from white privilege and white supremacy culture, from talking to other white people about all of these issues. And I have to say that I don't think it's enough to be an ally, because an ally is not someone who owns the issue bone deep. Allies have the ability to walk away at any time, for in the end, it is still another struggle. For the possibility of racism, white supremacy, and white privilege to be shattered, we each, regardless of our skin color or societal privilege, need to take it personally. To make it our struggle from the inside out, to be all in, invested 100%, unwilling to walk away, remain silent, or be complicit. If not, we pull the noose around all the Jesse Smallnitz necks tighter. Just another day in America. <laughs>